Good morning, everyone. Welcome once again to another service at Warden Full Gospel Assembly online. Thank you for the worship team in leading powerful and dynamic worship today. We're so glad that you are here, and hopefully you'll be able to connect with people via the chat room or by calling somebody. We really encourage that. Um, at the end of the service, please uh, stay tuned. Uh, we have a special announcement as to what is happening in about a month or so. So stay tuned after we close our service. I'll be making a brief, brief announcement. We begin a new series, as Pastor James mentioned, entitled, I Speak. What do we do with our words? How, how do we talk? What do we say? Um, I was reading a story about Ignatius Semmelweis. Maybe you heard of him, maybe you haven't, but he was a doctor in 1846. And Dr. Semmelweis, during his practice, worked at two maternity clinics next to each other. One clinic was staffed by doctors. The other clinic was staffed by midwives. And Dr. Semmelweis noticed something that was very upsetting and something that was very perplexing at the same time. In the doctor's clinic that he worked in, the women who were giving birth were dying of fever at five times the rate that women were passing away at the midwife clinic. And he couldn't figure out why this was happening. Now certainly, at that time, in the medical profession during the 1800s, they were still beginning to collect data, they were still beginning to evaluate autopsies and how to sanitize things better than they were doing. And Dr. Semmelweis began to pay attention to the difference between the life and death of these two clinics. Why people were dying at a higher rate in the doctor's clinic versus the midwife clinic. And so he reviewed what the clinics were doing. In the doctor's clinic, for example, childbirth was happening with women laying on their back. And yet in the midwife clinic, childbirth was being done sideways. So in the doctor's clinic, he recommended that they switch the birthing method. And after switching, he noticed no difference. It didn't help at all. It didn't matter which way children were being born. Still in the doctor's clinic, there was a higher death rate. He kept studying, evaluating, thinking. And then he noticed something where in the doctor's clinic, every time a lady after she had given birth and had passed, a priest would walk down the hallway ringing a bell. So he stopped that process, thinking that perhaps psychologically, when women heard this bell, they would get horrified and terrified of their fever and then die. And as you guessed it, that was not the cause of death either. But then he noticed that at the doctor's clinics, when doctors would do an autopsy as to why a certain lady would pass, they would do this autopsy without washing their hands or cleaning their utensils. And then they would deliver, many times, babies using that same methodology. Now, to us, in this day and age, it would seem absolutely obvious that you would have to do something to sanitize the facilities. But you got to remember, in 1846, germs had not yet been discovered. And so this whole idea of sanitization and disinfecting hadn't yet been discovered. Louis Pasteur, years later, would discover germs. But in 19, I mean, excuse me, in 1846, this wasn't the case. And so Dr. Simmelweis came up with this idea to encourage doctors to wash their hands and to use chlorine to clean the instrument. But the reason why he said you should use chlorine to use, clean the instruments was because he thought chlorine would eliminate the smell from the corpses in the hospital. Now, as you think about that, as you relive that kind of experience in those days, we know a lot more today. 
Yes, while he encouraged doctors to wash their hands and to use chlorine to clean the utensils, we in this day and age know that washing hands and disinfecting in this day and age has saved more lives than any other medical breakthrough in the history of medicine, and certainly in the past 150 years. But in 1846, that was not the case. Today, disinfecting. Today, cleaning utensils is a big deal. But Dr. Semmelweis simply stumbled upon it. It was a breakthrough. And yes, it may seem insignificant to us today. It may not seem significant in the least bit in your mind or attention span. Yet it was a life and death situation to that time period. It was a life and death implication to people who were in the hospital at that time. Now, I use that story as a metaphor in regards to our speech. While we understand that the words that we speak, our speech, things that we say, things that we speak is important to us, we really don't understand the significance and the power of our words. Now, seriously, please understand this. I, I'm trying to tell you seriously that there is life and there is death in the words that we speak. Now, you may think my metaphor, this whole description of life and death is an overstatement. You may think, is it really important and significant how I speak or what I say with my words? Are words really that important in my life? Notice what the Bible says in Proverbs. The Bible says in Proverbs chapter 18, verse 21, these words. The tongue can bring death or life. Those who love to talk will reap the consequences. Reap the consequences. That's, that's a, not a term we really use today. We would probably use the words such as, you will eat your words. The tongue can bring life or death, and those who love to talk will eat your, their words. We could use that kind of terminology for that verse today. Yet so often, many of us underestimate the impact that words can have in our lives. You see, what this Bible verse is describing for us is that your words, my words, are seeds that are planted. And those seeds bear fruit. And whatever words are planted will determine what you will or what you will not eat. I would like to submit to you this morning that our words can speak life or they can speak death into the situation around us. Our words can speak life or they can speak death into the lives of people around us. We need to understand that on average, every single day, most of us speak about 16,000 words a day. You could potentially write with the words you speak every single day, a 60-page book with the words that you speak every single day. That, to me, is a lot of words. Some of you may speak more words than that. Some of you may speak less words than that. But on average, 16,000 words are spoken by each individual every single day. And with so many words being spoken, it is easy for us to underestimate the power of our words. It is easy for us to underestimate the value that each potential word that we say could possibly have on another person's life, how those words can influence their situation. Now, when you add in our day and age, social media, the words that are written and said on Facebook and Instagram and Twitter and TikTok, emails and texts, all those venues, I am telling you, we use a lot of words every single day. Yet what Proverbs chapter 18 verse 21 is saying 
is that each one of those words, whatever venue, whatever medium that you use to speak those words, each one of those words matter. And we should be really careful and not careless with the words that we speak. Sometimes we think, who cares? Who cares if we underestimate some of our speech? Can I tell you, it's like going to the ocean and taking a handful of sand and picking up a handful of sand and watching a little bit of sand drop from our hands. That's what it is when we speak our words. Who cares if a little bit of sand drops from our hands? And sometimes we relate to the words that we speak in a similar fashion. Who cares about the words that I say? It doesn't matter that much. It doesn't influence that much. Who cares about if I said a crossword that impacted somebody? Who cares? And so, so many times in life, we can get careless with the words that we speak. Now, I can tell you, from a personal standpoint, from a personal perspective, I can tell you that for someone like me, who has to talk publicly quite often, it is especially difficult to use the words that need to be said at times, especially when meanings change or cultural nuances change and words in our culture suddenly mean completely different things. I, I am, I'm remembering back in the day in my generation, words that were popular in my generation back a few years have a completely different meaning today. And while you try to be relevant, you use words that you think are popular and comfortable to you, yet you find out in the process of speaking those words that it doesn't mean the same thing today what it meant before. Like this police officer just recently who, in the state of Georgia, stopped a motorist. A police officer with 28 years experience who, who said while stopping a motorist, we only kill black people. Made this comment. And when people found out what he had said in the process of stopping a motorist, he was fired from, the, from his job. Words potentially spoken, which I am sure today he regrets. We are all, listen, we are all constantly using words. Every one of us, we use words. And those words that we use have the power of life and death. Some of you know what I'm talking about. Perhaps in your home, growing up, words were spoken, words spoken to you had that power of life and death. You remember those words. Some of those words had labels attached to them, and those labels were given to you, those nicknames were given to you. Just a few words, power-packed words, words that were said by a parent or a teacher perhaps a coach, a sibling, or a friend. And today you vividly remember those words that were spoken to you because those words either brought life and hope into your spirit or they killed something within your spirit. They brought death to you. I love the words of Jesus found in Matthew chapter 12, verse 36 and 7. Notice what Jesus says from the message paraphrase. Jesus said, let me tell you something. Every one of these careless words is going to come back to haunt you. There will be a time of reckoning. Words are powerful. Take them seriously. Words can be your salvation. Words can also be your damnation. That's an incredibly powerful Statement. Those are strong words by Jesus. And what Jesus is saying is that our words are revealing. 
to who we are. They truly reveal what's inside of each one of our hearts. The words that come out, the words that we speak, reveal who we are. And our words are powerful, and we need to take them seriously. In Genesis chapter 1, verse 3 through verse 5, you see in these verses from the very beginning that God has hardwired words into the universe. God said in verse 3, let there be light, and there was light, and God saw that the light was good. Then he separated the light from the darkness, and God called the light day and the darkness night. Evening passed, and morning came, marking the first day. This description is a description of how God wired words into the universe. Genesis, if you read the first two verses prior to verse 3, Genesis starts with the phrase that there was darkness. There was no form. There was a void. In other words, it is describing a nothing environment. There was absolutely nothing. And then verse 3 of Genesis chapter 1. Then God said... Then God said, God spoke into nothingness. God spoke into the darkness. And God said in verse 3 of Genesis chapter 1, God said, let there be light. From the very beginning, or at the initiation of time, the tool God used to create was the tool of word. He used words. He spoke. He spoke the universe into existence. God says, and it is. God says, and it happens. God speaks. He uses words. So when God uses words, he brings light. He brings life. God uses his word to build up, to create, and he speaks against darkness. He speaks into the darkness. And so from the very beginning, when you read the book of Genesis, from the beginning, you see that words are used. Words are used to create life. But then notice what happens two chapters later. In Genesis chapter 3, verse 1, notice what happens. It says the serpent was the shrewdest of all the wild animals the Lord God had made. And one day, the serpent asked the woman, did God really say you must eat, not eat the fruit from any of the trees in the garden? So here you see, in this passage, you see the words, that words have the power of death. Two chapters earlier in Genesis chapter 1, you saw that the words had the power of life. Here you see that the words have the power of death. This is the chapter where sin enters the world. Satan comes on the scene in the form of a, certain, of a serpent, and he speaks. And when he speaks, notice what he does. When he speaks, he attacks what God had said just a couple of uh, chapters earlier. In other words, the enemy uses words to bring death where there was life. The enemy uses words to recreate darkness where there was light. Now here, here's, what, here's what you need to notice. It's very interesting. Even though the serpent uses words that are not true, it didn't keep those words from having power. But the moment Adam and Eve began to believe the words of the serpent, and gave life to them, they empowered those words. So what you see here is God speaking. Then you see the serpent speaking. And from the very beginning, you see the power of words. You see the power of life and death that is found in words. God speaks He creates, he builds, 
He blesses, there is light. The serpent speaks, he tempts, he accuses, he deceives, he destroys. See, I want to underscore this again, and I want you to grab a hold of this. Please note this again. Words are hardwired into the universe. There is power in words. Now turn to John, if you have your Bibles open, turn to John chapter 1, verse 1 through verse 5, because here's an interesting, here's an interesting comparison. It says in verse 1 of John chapter 1, in the beginning the word already existed. Now, did you see this? In the beginning, the Word already existed. Now, John doesn't call Jesus Son of God or Jesus or the Messiah. He calls Jesus the Word. In the beginning, the Word already existed. The Word was with God, and the Word was God. He existed in the beginning with God. God created everything through Him, and nothing was created except through Him. Verse 4. The Word gave life to everything that was created, and His life brought light to everyone. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness can never extinguish it. So what John is saying here is he is saying, remember Genesis chapter 1? The Word, Jesus, was with God. And in Genesis chapter 1, this Word... Jesus, who's Jesus, spoke light into darkness. And so John is introducing Jesus as the word that brings light into darkness. Now the word that is used here in the Greek is the word logos. The word for the word is logos. And logos is an expression or a declaration of a thought. This is who Jesus is. He is the Word in the flesh. And so what the writer John is underlining for us here is the power of the Word. That God's Word in Jesus brings light and life into the darkness. And so throughout the time that Jesus was on this earth in the flesh, He was constantly speaking the word of heaven into its environment. He was constantly speaking the light of life into the community. He was constantly speaking the light of life into the people that surrounded Jesus. He says, for example, in Mark chapter 1, verse 38, notice these words. Jesus replied, we must go on to other towns as well, and I will preach to them the word to them too. That is why I came. And in Luke chapter 4, verse 18 and 19, Jesus saying, the spirit of the Lord is upon me, and he has anointed me to bring good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim that captives will be released, that the blind will see, that the oppressed will be set free. Verse 19, and the time has come, the Lord's favor, the Lord's favor has come. So through the words, the speaking of the words, the favor of the Lord has come. Listen, friends, we cannot miss this. Jesus was with God from the beginning. Light coming into darkness. In the physical world, in John chapter 1, Jesus is the Word, and He brings this light into darkness. And Jesus speaks. And when He speaks, He speaks good news. He speaks freedom. He speaks healing and deliverance. There is power in his words. He speaks blessing. He speaks peace. You see, the point is, Jesus used words as a tool to bring life where there was death. He brought light into the darkness. And since we, 
His people are made in the image of God. He has given us the ability to speak, the ability to use words, the ability to use our tongue and our voice. And with that ability, we have the power. Listen, you and I have the power to either bring life or death into the world around us using our words. Make no mistake about it. Our words are incredibly powerful, beyond your imagination, more than you could ever realize. Words have the power. Your words have the power to either build people up or tear them down. Your words have the power to create or to, to destroy. Your power have the, your, the power of your words has the power to oppress people or to set people free. You may, you may think, you may think that words are so very insignificant. But I'm here to tell you that your words are a matter of life and death. See, Dr. Zimmelfeis, he had one message to the two clinics that he worked at. He had one message that he was trying to present. The message was, wash your hands. Wash your hands. He saw the suffering. He saw the death. He saw the pain. And he knew the difference that sanitation could make. He saw the difference that could happen and germs being eliminated and affections being eliminated just by people washing their hands. And so he had one message to them. He had one message to the clinicians in the clinics, the doctors and the nurses. Please wash your hands. And unfortunately, no one listened to those words. No one believed those words. And even though Dr. Simmelweis had an, a life-giving process that he wanted to put in place, because no one listened to him, no one believed in him, he became so obsessed, which caused him to be admitted into a mental institution where he died at the age of 47. Why? Why did doctors not receive his message? It seems so natural to us today. So natural for us to wash our hands and to sanitize and to disinfect. Why? did doctors not receive the message from Dr. Semmelweis? Well, there were two reasons. Number one, the message was very simple. And secondly, doctors felt that it was an indictment on them because instead of helping, they were actually spreading the germs from patient to patient to patient. And the very first instinct, the very first instinct that we all have to deal with is we reject anything that would be self-indicting. To really understand this concept of words, in a nutshell, to really understand when we're talking about words, it means that we need to incriminate ourselves. Because without exception, myself including, I think every single one of us, every person who is watching today, every person who is listening to these words, without exception, all of us, all of us have used words carelessly. By the usage of our words, we have brought hurt, we have brought pain, we have brought angst into the lives of other people simply by the words that we spoke. And in our minds, initially, and our nat certainly our natural response, our natural response to the idea that our words are the power and the life and death in someone else's life, instinctively at that moment, we begin to think that it can't be upon ourselves. We there's this indictment upon ourselves. We have incriminated ourselves. And so our initial 
and natural response would be that we would shrink away and we would withdraw ourselves because none of us would ever think or try to do and bring hurt to other people. That's not naturally what we would want to do, but we do do it. None of us wants to do it, but it happens. And so naturally, the same thing that happened to these doctors in these clinics, the same thing happens to us. We, at first instinct, reject. We reject what we possibly know to be true because it incriminates us. I had a friend, Ian Green, a while back we were talking. We were talking about this entire topic, about the importance of overcoming negativity, overcoming criticisms and bad attitudes, and how so many times people drag us down by the words that they that they say to us, and how quickly we slip into the pit of self-despair because of words that have been spoken to us. And he told me, he said, what I have done is I have done, is I have written affirmations that reveal my standing with God. And every time that words come against me, every time that I feel the the heavy weight of what somebody has said to me and the dragging down of those words in my life. He says, I take these affirmations and I read them to build up my spirit. And I said to him, I said, will you send me some of those affirmations so that I can have them? And so he did. Let me share some of those affirmations with you today. Here are some of the affirmations that he wrote down. Hopefully some of these will bring encouragement to your heart. He said, goodness and mercy is before me and behind me, and it's making a way for me. I am forever loved by my heavenly Father. I am abiding in God's love, and my confidence is growing day by day. And I, as, an, as I am an object I am an object of his abundant grace, love, favor, provision, and financial success. This is making me become a resource base and a practical help to those in need. What I see as challenges are but timing issues, and all will end well. I am daily focusing my faith in the Almighty God, for whom nothing is impossible. I am experiencing abundant resources to fill, fulfill my gift of giving and my passion to be ta a tangible help to the poor, the widow, and the orphan. Today is a good day as I receive and release the blessing of God to those around me. Now those are affirmations that he uses, words that he implants within his own spirit, words that will uplift his spirit in times where other words have brought him low. Listen, sometimes you and I, we wake up in the middle of the night and there are negative words in our mind. Negative words that speak to us. Negative words that enter into our spirits. Words that hurt Words that may cause you to harden your heart. Perhaps words that would create bitterness towards other people. Perhaps words that would remind you of pain that has been caused to you. Emotional upheaval and pain in your life that lingers into the day as you wake up to face a new day. Sometimes when you and I are overwhelmed and frustrated and we feel empty, and you don't have much patience, it's easy to accept and to live and to believe the negative words that have no purpose and have nothing to offer in your life. Listen, all of us, we need to walk in the truth. We need to live in the truth. The truth is, you are filled with God's grace. There is an abundance of grace that is available to you. Grace for you to give and to release to others. And you need to understand that God in your life has already prepared for you in advance 
a work that he wants to accomplish with your life. And yet today, here we are. We're inundated with fear, with what is happening in the world, COVID-19, vaccinations, do we get them or don't we get them, political, political incompetence, people are stressed out, people are worried, people are living in fear, they don't know what is going to happen in the future, their hope is gone. Yet here are some incredible examples of walking in God's truth, listening to His Word to bring light and hope into your being. Look what it says in 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 7. Notice these words, give all your worries and cares and all your fears to God, for he cares about you. In other words, I am not going to be anxious. I am not going to be worried. I'm not going to be weighted down. Instead, I am casting and putting my burdens on the Lord because I know he cares for me. I am not going to be embracing the words of negativity that bring me down. Instead, I am going to release and give my cares to the Lord. 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 7. For God has not given us a spirit of fear and timidity, but of power, of love, and of self-discipline. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 16 through verse 18. Always be joyful, never stop praying, be thankful in all circumstances, for this is God's will for you who belong to Christ Jesus. Oh, I pray, let the truth of God's word, his spoken word, settle upon you. Let the word of God speak life into your being. To honor Dr. Simmelweis since 1848, to honor Dr. Simmelweis, several hospitals, medical schools, women clinics have been named after him. Unfortunately for the good doctor, he never saw any of this in the future. But there's also a term that is taught to medical doctors today, studying medicine in residences all over the world. And it's called the Simmelweis reflex. Notice what it says. The knee jerk, the Simmelweis reflex is the knee jerk reflex to reject evidence without investigation and experimentation because it goes against what has been accepted or practiced. Can I tell you something, friends? Can I tell you that that reflex, that knee-jerk reflex, is in all of us? Just because it hasn't been practiced and just because it hasn't been accepted, I'm not going to give it any space. But if there is evidence for it, shouldn't you and I at least try it, investigate it even if you've never been open to it before. Listen, maybe you are listening today, maybe you are watching, maybe you're hearing my words today. Maybe you don't think that words that you speak, maybe you don't think they make, a much, they make much difference in your life or anybody else's life. That's a knee-jerk reaction. It's a knee-jerk reaction to reject this message. Maybe you grew up in an environment. Maybe you grew up in a household where words were talked carelessly and freely. All kinds of words came out. And that's how you talk now. Because that's how you talked as a family when you grew up. But what if, what if, after listening to this message, what if all of your speech what if, listen, what if potentially you begin to realize that all of your speech could become the seeds, the seed that would begin or become or speak life to somebody else? What if potentially the words that you speak become the seeds that bear good fruit in somebody else's life? Here's the challenge. Here's a challenge for all of us who say, I'm a follower of Jesus. 
the words that we affirm and place over our lives and share with others, do those words bring life or do they bring death to somebody? If you are a follower of Jesus and you are comprehending and truly believing this message and you are willing to do inventory in your life, If you are willing to engage in that, are your words that you speak, are those words bringing life or death to the people that are in your sphere of influence, the people around you? That's the big question that you need to answer during this series. Am I providing through the words, the 16,000 plus words that I use a day, are they bringing life or death to my environment? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I pray this morning for all of us, including myself, may your Holy Spirit reaffirm in us the power of the words that we use. May we collectively, O God, live a life that by the words that we use, that we bring life, that we create light in a world of darkness. I pray this in the name of Jesus for all of us. Amen. Amen. As I said at the beginning, before we close today, I just want to make a brief, brief announcement We're all hoping and longing for church to reopen, and hopefully, hopefully within the next four weeks, we plan on once again being able to meet publicly for those who feel they can and want to and feel safe to be here. We'll go through the natural processes of protocol and sanitation and all that kind of stuff to make sure everyone is safe, but we're hoping that within four weeks we will once again be able to open our doors for anybody who would like to come and participate in the live service. So continue to be thinking about that and praying about that. We certainly want to have an Easter weekend that is a big celebration in our sanctuary this year. We missed it last year, but we're longing and looking forward to a big Easter celebration in this sanctuary this Easter. God bless you. Thank you for paying attention. Thank you for participating. Thank you for watching. Have a great week. We'll see you again next week. God bless you.